over. So that's why we have people out here that are gatekeepers that are not allowing people in because mm -hmm. we're in a society where, especially in a state where by design there were not people of color allowed. It's actually part of my presentation for the county. There's a timeline that starts with Manifest Destiny that outlines all of the housing laws, and there are hundreds that um, contribute to why, why we're at where we are in this society. So all of that was by design. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why there, there's an individualistic approach because if you go to DC, if you go to Atlanta, they have the same problems, but it's not the same culture. It's, culture. Not, the, it's not the same, mm -hmm. oh, well, there can only be one. Or I see your last name is Deloney, so you must, yeah, there's none of that. Yeah. People don't do that. So people have more opportunity for there to be more than one person. And I, I personally, just on a personal note, I tend to forgive those people, um, not their actions, but their uh, motivations because they're doing that to survive. Because I know a lot of people who I walk into a room and I'm like, eh, but I understand why they're doing that. And as somebody who was a former tenant activist, now I work in housing policy, um, that was a huge hurdle for me because here I am trying to get help to remedy the cycle of economic oppression that my family's been experiencing since changing their, since getting rid of their indigenous identity and coming down here, coming through the South and then coming back down through Skamania because you couldn't own property if you were black and indigenous, mm -hmm. only if your father was white, just to let you know. Um, <laughs> Having to having to think about getting into tenant advocacy because I wanted to remedy that for myself and for the other people that have been here since Bamport, the right. attitude when I came in was, oh, well, it just started happening in 2009. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. So you only care about that. Well, let's get more of the black people who have been experiencing this for a long time because when we take care of the needs of the most marginalized, everyone else gets taken care of. No, we don't care about that. We don't care about getting black people. So that was by design. So we oh really God. have to work hard to undo that. And without spilling any tea, I'm just trying to say we have to work hard to undo those things and unlock those things for other people. Because if we keep paying lip service to it, like somebody, when I wasn't at my desk, I went to the, I went to get some tea <laughs> and I came back and somebody had put something on my desk talking about if we continue to, to discuss and to argue about it without action, is that really, is that really doing anything to solve the problem? Yeah, but people put but speaking desk, out is action, action because when you speak up, it's no longer complicit, right? We're talking right? about the people that are making decisions, um, that are making policy decisions, yeah. delaying action by continuing to argue about the same things, Perfect. not the actual problem, but just arguing the about bureaucracy. the same things. So not actual activism, not actually going out here and speaking toward the issue, but arguing about, well, this, this ordinance is going to make us live next to criminals. This ordinance is going to make us arguing about something when the root cause is that you don't provide people with economic Thank opportunity. You. They have to turn to crime to take care of people. And Measure 11 probably prevented a lot of people from having the solid future that they deserve. So let's talk about how Measure you prevented 11. people. Measure, Measure 11? 11? Yeah, I don't trust Measure it. 11? If you spit her, if you well, spit on somebody that hits them and you get 77 months, the judge is like not discrimination. Mass incarceration is yeah. also yeah. Even for minors, even for minors. It, yep. was, it was Oregon's it was suggestion huge. to three strikes your own. Yeah, so you could do, and it could be, it could be really non-violent. It's really increased penalties. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's a, it's unfair penalties for for certain crimes. Mm -hmm. So that person then can't get that job. That person then can't mm -hmm. get that education. Can't get financial aid. Can't vote. Can't do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you are expect. And now we're just arguing about living next to these mm -hmm. mythical criminals. Yeah. That you know what I'm saying? And, and it's kind of reflected. Let's say that we, we have a state that says that they're progressive, but our, our city's budget for policing is 58% of the entire budget. So right. that means that even though we don't have a lot of crime and even though we're a small part of the population, you've identified all of our children and every opportunity we have to be social in mm -hmm. the city right. as a criminal response that right. needs community policing. Mm -hmm. And again, that has contained us and has also generated an opportunity for us to lose the property that we fought to get past the redlining. Like, I remember when the gang stuff started coming and becoming documented, and they would make it illegal for us to live in our own communities or to visit our grandparents or to go to certain neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, because of what they identified as gangs. But now, you know, 25, 30 years later, we have audits that say they were just um, identifying and creating a form of information about who these people were, which is not too much different than patty rolling, right? Back mm -hmm. in the slave days when they would right. check your paperwork to make sure they knew who you were. So even when you said people would ask your last name and then, oh, okay, well, we know who owned you, so we don't really have to do anything right. for you because we've already helped your people or we've already recognized that we uh, have established that family. So, um, exactly. yeah. Like, yeah. 
I noticed when I came back to Portland in 2010, I had lived in Texas so long that my accent kind of threw people off and I was treated like a first class citizen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as soon as they found out I was from Portland, it was like, oh, you know, Don't like you, you out here and you trying to do like with the back in the day. And I'm like, oh, so we still fighting her. So it, it's wow. not as progressive. But I think, again, when we talk about housing justice and having access, um, all of those characteristics of social behavior do matter, right? They do. And my question is, if you're not allowing people to get housing, where do you think they're going? Where, if you, these criminals, which I'm sorry, but some of these people who look like regular citizens who have committed horrible crimes and gotten away from them, right. those are the people that are probably living in their building because it's not on their record. And they're sitting on the boards. They're sitting on the boards. They're sitting on the committees. They're the stakeholders. Right. They're working with the bureaus. Where are the people supposed <laughs> to go so you won't, so you won't give them housing? You won't, you won't rent to them. They end up on the street. So they're in your neighborhood anyway. Yeah. Because there's camps everywhere. So there's a cycle. So really, they're not gone. So now we have to stop arguing, arguing a small mythical point about this, and actually get to, and actually get to it. And I think uh, activism, uh, certain types of activism, uh, activism I think driven by personal, uh, personal political gain, can. Uh, hey, I'm. Hey, it's hard working for the government. <laughs> I, I have to say, but, but people, uh, people whose motivation is not for the people creates that that cycle in activism where we get stuck in this rut and we're not actually doing stuff but then we have groups of people who are out here trying to do things and we need to focus our attention there rather than getting into these arguments because I feel like a lot could have been done by now absolutely and I mean and that brings the call one of the reasons that in our press we we said that this event was not only you know intentionally on April 4th of the anniversary of Dr. King's murder but also to honor you know people like Nipsey Hussle and all these different um, artists and community members and, and community organizers that are in our communities, we know we are unsung. We know that people don't realize the amount of sacrifice it takes to help community feel empowered when every structural entity says that you do not matter. Um, and the biggest conflict is with yourself when you're trying to provide those services in community. So we just have to be mindful that those critical parts are things that um, the patriarchs do recognize as well. They they basically analyze us and they understand human behavior and the plans and policies are put in place and are driven based on what is going to be the response of the people. What does market research show us? What does you know our, our data show us? What does it suggest? And so until we do build community, and I don't mean just being the recipients of um, community outreach, but also wanting to engage in civics, uh, we won't have a leg up on it. And I think that having this space and being able to provide this type of outreach through the legal platforms, it's going to be, we're going to do that. And our and the elders in our community need to be brought to the table mm -hmm. with that, that initiative. And Fendi, you were going to say something. Oh my goodness, so many things been popping off in my head. Um, you mentioned Danforth earlier, and I literally was just thinking earlier, like my family lives in Danforth. Mm -hmm. I haven't like looked into like the research, mm -hmm. but to think about like, that's like a significant event in Portland, right? And then like they were out in North Portland um, and they had land once upon a time and my family no longer has that land. So I'm in a space now where I see um, one, renting and then um, the position and the situation that I was in, I seen like the discrimination with, with, within even the program that I was in. Like, oh, we don't even have to have the, the unit ready for you, really. Like I moved into the unit and like <laughs> it wasn't ready. But I seen because of the situation that I was in um, how um, even maybe the owner may have thought I didn't I don't have to do that like you know and it was through a um, uh, you know, with a program that you know uh -huh. what I'm saying so um, thinking back like no, okay, oversight my, my the oversight my family once upon a time had land and I'm in a space now where I'm like yo like some people are inheriting land mm -hmm. you yes, know they are. like and that's going in even more into the cycle that like we need to that I'm excited about the clinic because we get like the opportunities for people to be informed about things mm -hmm. um, and think more critically about our environment where we're at and that's mm -hmm. where I'm at <laughs> right now. Black ownership is down and if, if the numbers tell you anything in, in Oregon right now, there's clearly a pattern here that started in Vanport, like you said, because if, if they weren't displaced, because I feel like that was like the key moment of displacement, then we would have, we would have mm -hmm. land and as somebody who is a new homeowner who worked her butt off for years, for way more years than any of my colleagues that are not black, 
for themselves to get Amen. the land. Oh I had God. to get. I had to try and get something and try to be and try to be close to my family. It was near impossible just because that happened to uh, my grandmother was was in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. My uncle was in Zimbabwe. Like it's it's that close yeah. to where we were. We are not that far removed mm -hmm. from it because it was the forties. So 